Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be back to uh, talk a little bit about the Gospels this morning. Um, didn't know whether to expect repeat attenders or pitchforks after yesterday. And uh, I don't see any yet, but the week is young, so we, we may get there yet. Uh, so yesterday was just a big introduction to the Gospels, right? And really, you can just kind of go on and on and on with all of their idiosyncrasies and complexities. And really, you can spend a lifetime perusing them, thinking about them, reflecting on them, coming back, looking at them from reverse, from frontwards, up, down. Uh, so, but now we're going to dive in a little deep and look at the actual Gospels one by one. And if we're lucky today, we'll get through Mark. Uh, you know, I've done this series at various churches, and uh, sometimes it just goes on and on and on because there's just so much. Uh, but I hope uh, you'll find some interesting things here. So we'll start with Mark. Why are we starting with Mark? Uh, Mark's gospel, oh, by the way, I think I should introduce myself. Uh, I was told there would be no more introductions, your family now, so you just go up there and introduce yourself. Uh, Juan Hernandez, I'm a, a teacher, a professor at... at uh, Bethel University. I teach uh, Bible and theology there. I've been there for it's my 14th year, and uh, and this is my first time here at uh, Oko Oko Boji. And I was told, do not call it a camp. Is that right? This is a Bible conference, a serious Bible conference. So you know, a major faux pas for a non-Iowan, I guess. Uh, okay, so so uh, we'll dive in deep with the Gospel of Mark. So the first thing. I just want to let you know the reason why we're starting with Mark, not with Matthew, is because Mark is believed to have been the first gospel written. Uh, this is the consensus among scholars. Uh, there are any number of reasons for it. Unfortunately, none of the gospels gave us their you know, actual date of writing and where they wrote it or anything like that. They just kind of appeared. And uh, Matthew was placed first because it was the most popular gospel in your canon. You should be aware of that, that your uh, New Testament and the order of the Gospels, and this is true, you know, uh, moving on through the New Testament, is not a chronological order. It's by and large a theological order, right? And obviously the stories about Jesus are important, so they come first. But Matthew was the most uh, popular Gospel. It was the one that was copied the most, appears in the most manuscripts, cited the most. The least popular Gospel is actually Mark. Mark's gospel, if you go through it and you, you, if you're aware of the other gospels and you're reading through Mark, you realize, oh my God, there's a lot missing here, right? And it was, a, it was an easy equation for the early church. Well, you read the one that has the most, right? You read the one that has all the details. So that's why Matthew comes first. But historically speaking, Mark is the one who was most likely written first. And these basically are based off of arguments from scholars and all kinds of considerations, and we'll look at a few. So Mark, we'll start with Mark because it was first. The other thing you should know about Mark, and here, you know, I will delve back and forth between kind of scholarship and, and, and pl practical application. Uh, you should know that the Gospels are actually all anonymous. The names, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, are added later. Now, where do we get this knowledge? Basically, church tradition. Church tradition has a series of stories and a series of accounts that tie particular uh, people with these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, right? But the actual manuscripts, the earliest manuscripts, do not have the names on them, right? It's not as if Matthew said, hi, I, Matthew, am writing this Gospel, and I hung around with Jesus. We were fishing buddies, and let me tell you his story. They don't have anything like that. It just begins with the story. All of them do. Right? So Mark, now according to tradition, he was presumably a follower of Peter, roamed around with Peter. He served as either his translator or interpreter. Those are the, the two options for uh, the Greek word behind uh, uh, this person. And the interesting thing about its association with Peter, it has a very important function, which is that it lends Mark's gospel apostolic authority. Right? Mark is not an apostle. Neither was Luke an apostle. So how does Luke get in? Well, Luke is associated with Paul. Hung around with Paul, traveled with Paul, etc. Right? So, so these names, in and of themselves, did not have enough authority. They were associated with individuals who were connected or who were apostles, and therefore they're considered to have apostolic status. So what you have is a blend of kind of historical and traditional information that we've received over centuries about these Gospels, and people don't really think about it, don't really read about it, don't really... 
you know, lose any sleep over it until you hear it for the first time. Gospels are anonymous. Like, Whoa, what's, what's that about? Right? Peter's interesting because in Mark's gospel, Peter is the first disciple that's mentioned. Right? He's the first one who has the encounter with Jesus. Right? So he's the first one mentioned. He's also the very last disciple that's mentioned. Right? At the very end, when the ladies go to the tomb... And they find a man there, and he says, uh, he's not here, he's gone ahead to Galilee. And of course, there's no resurrection appearance in in Mark, as we learned yesterday. Uh, He says, tell the others, and tell Peter. So interestingly, this connection of Mark and Peter seems to be somehow borne out by the gospel. He's the first one mentioned, and he's the last one mentioned in the gospel. Very interesting. This is one of the things that I love about the gospels. Oftentimes, they bookend things in very subtle ways. They make connections that unless you're, you're on the ball and paying attention or someone directs you to it, you'll never notice it. That's significant, and it's really significant because in the last uh, scenario Peter was in, in that gospel, he was busy denying Jesus, right? I never knew him, right? And he starts you know, cursing up a storm about it. And Jesus had told him earlier in that gospel, whoever's ashamed of me and the cross before this wicked and adulterous generation, I will be ashamed of him and before my father, right? So Peter, for all intents and purposes, failed that test and was lost. And the last thing you hear, tell Peter. I mean, that just gives just like a ray of hope. Yeah, Peter really screwed up. He did exactly what he was told not to do. He did that. The worst thing you could do, deny Jesus. And the very last thing that the women hear is tell Peter. Right? In other words, meet up with Jesus in Galilee. So you got these interesting things going on that are subtle. You you might not even think about it, right? This is just a detail. Just happened, right? Um, You have details sometimes that you don't know what to do with. Right, uh, Mark's uh, gospel is the is the account that has that little story of of the young man who was following them, and and uh, when he was they were going to apprehend him, he runs away naked. Right? Who is that? Right? It's not part of a parable, a story, or an account. There's no exchange. You don't have a name. You don't have words. What is that doing there? And we don't know. Scholars think that that might actually be John Mark's way of saying, "I was there." right? I'm the guy that, that, that ran out like that, right? But we don't know. You're never told. So you're left with a lot of uh, open-ended, you know, things that your curiosity will be endless, and you can kind of creatively imagine the scenarios and try and reconstruct it, but at the end, all you have is the narrative. And what we're left with is the task of trying to put it together. Okay, what is going on here? So, so this is the Gospel of Mark. First Gospel, actually anonymous, connected to Mark, connected to Peter. We're going to focus on its narrative features. And why do I emphasize narrative features? Narrative features because all we have is a narrative, right? It might have been the earliest gospel written, but it is not the earliest New Testament document written. That's interesting because we're used to thinking historically, especially in our modern age, right? What actually happened, when it happened, etc. Anybody have any idea what the first New Testament writing is believed to have been? First Thessalonians. That is the A student from yesterday. She's still here. She came back. You don't need to be here. Come up and join me. Uh, First Thessalonians, for heaven's sake, right? Paul's, I mean, you know, Paul may have written other letters. We don't have all the letters he's written, right? But that's the first one to survive. You think about that. All of Paul's letters were written before the first gospel was written, Mark. It is very likely that... uh, Paul was already dead, having been beheaded when Mark was written, right? Mark is believed to have been written in the late 60s, early 70s, right, during the the war in in Jerusalem, right? Um, So that's really interesting. It is the first gospel. It is an early gospel. It is an account of Jesus who's earlier than everybody else. Yet in terms of actual writing, a lot has gone on. Everything that Paul's life, his ministry... Uh, his life, death, all of that happened, and then the first gospels written. And also at this time, you have, you know, in, in the seventh century, uh, seventh a decade, uh, you have war with the Romans. You also have an influx of Gentiles coming into the church. And you have to ask yourself, in what ways does this particular gospel reflect that time period? And you have an interesting balance between a gospel that reflects on the life of Jesus 
but reflects on the needs of the people, of the church at that particular time, seventh decade out, right? 60s, 70s, right? So that's something to be attuned to. It's not unlike when you watch a movie, and it's a movie presumably about the past, some events, some historical events in the past, right? But you can't help but notice that it's talking about our times, right? It's a thinly veiled way of, of, of joining us and saying, look, those things in the past are relevant here. That's what's happening here, right? And we're going to see that. So we're going to focus on the narrative, right, which is written 30, 40 years after Jesus left the earth, right? Matthew, Luke, and John even further out. Okay. Son of God. So we're going to focus on several themes that you have in this book and the way the, the author puts it together. By the way, if you have a burning question, maybe not even a burning question, maybe you want to burn me at the stake, raise your hand. Raise your hand, line up, you can do it. Um, I tend to go just kind of, a, you know, it's like the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> And just shooting information out. Somebody told me yesterday it was like a, a, a water hose, right? Um, I can't help that, right? But if I see a hand, that's the Spirit's way of saying, all right, slow down, answer a question or two. Of course, we can answer questions throughout the week. You catch me running around outside, you can ask me a question. Uh, but don't hesitate. Okay, Son of God. Uh, this, obviously, we take Son of God for granted. We know Jesus is the Son of God. We don't really think about it. Yes, he's God's Son, right? Uh, I just want to point out the ways in which Mark pulls this theme together, right? And one thing you notice is that he's identified at the very beginning, the very beginning, right? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God, right? This is what it's going to be about, Son of God. And it shows up at the very end, chapter 15, verse 39. This is where you have uh, the Roman soldier. He's next to Jesus. Jesus dies, and he says, truly this man was... The Son of God, right? Now, again, if you're just looking at it, there was a Roman soldier and he said that. Well, of course he said that. Fine. But no, it bookends the gospel. I'm going to be telling you about the Son of God, right? And it's not a simple thing, right? It's a complex thing. It's a nuanced thing. It's actually even a scandalous and troubling thing because it doesn't pan out the way people expected it to pan out, right? I mean, I know you know the ending of this thing. He doesn't sit and reign forever and ever at the end of the gospel. So you've got the narrator identifying him as God's son. You have the Roman soldier identifying him as God's son. But you also have God himself identifying Jesus as his son. Now, I'm pointing all of this out because irrespective of the characters who are claiming this is God's son, remember, Mark or the author is the one who's pulling all of this together, right? Right? Uh, you know, people who are well-read, people who are into literature, people who, who, who love narrative and writing find this kind of thing very interesting and very appealing, right? And I will tell you honestly, if you ever have trouble working with the Gospels and wondering about so they're different and how do I reconcile all this, if you immerse yourself in reading, period, reading as a, as a, as a life of the mind exercise, it will make you more creatively and contemplatively nimble to be able to appreciate the versatility of, of, of these Gospels, which is exactly what they are, versatile. Okay, so God identifies them. Jesus gets baptized, and there's a voice that comes from heaven, you are my beloved son, right? This is my beloved son, right? So God himself is bears, bears witness. In chapter 9, verse 7, that's the scene of the transfiguration, right? Jesus is up there with a few of his disciples. They don't know what to do. A cloud comes over Jesus, and there's a voice that says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him, right? I mean, very stereotypical, and then in chapter 12, Jesus tells the parable of the wicked tenants and basically about this man that planted a vineyard and, and he sent his slaves to go check out the vineyard. And what do they do? They beat the slaves and some they beat and some they killed. And then the owner says of the vineyard says, well, I'll send my son, my beloved son. That's coded language, just like God. God here sends his son and say, hey, look, this is the heir. We'll do worse with him than we did with the others and we'll keep it for ourselves. And they kill him, right? So God says it twice, and Jesus in a parable talks about, you know, this owner, you know, and his beloved son who gets killed, right? So son of God is a big deal here. And by the way, every gospel does it differently. Remember how we looked at Luke yesterday? And one way Luke points out Jesus as God's son is having Jesus in a temple, saying, I'm in my father's house, right? I don't understand where the confusion lies, okay? Jesus, of course, is aware of his own identity, 
right? He is certainly portrayed that way in the Gospels. Chapter 14, verse 61, this is the scene where he is being interrogated by Caiaphas. And he says, you know, tell us right now, are you son or the son of the blessed one, right? Which basically is son of God because a Jewish priest is not going to say God. They say son of the blessed one, right? And what does Jesus say? I am. And then, and then to, to make matters worse, <laughs> he says, not only that, but you're going to see the son of man coming in the clouds in glory, which basically is Jesus pronouncing judgment upon him right and of course he rips his clothes and he says what further evidence do we need crucify him right so jesus uh says i am now interestingly mark's gospel and this is true of mark matthew and luke they're not big on the i am statements like this doesn't necessarily need to be a theologically loaded i am that i am kind of statement he's saying no i am i am that son of the blessed one john however takes that to a whole other level right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. Uh, I am the door. I am the, you know, on and on and on and on. I am the living water, right? And ultimately, he simply says at some point, I am. Remember that one? Almost got him killed, right? The, you know, the, the Jews are, are, are after him, and he says, you know, uh, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. I mean, which is absurd, right? You know, Abraham was, even back then, it was still a couple thousand years ago. And they're like, you're not even 30 years old and you've seen Abraham? That was already a problem enough. And then he says, well, before Abraham was, I am, right? And they just pick up, you know, they run him out of town, right? John's statements are so utterly offensive and scandalous. We're so churched up, we don't even notice it. Right? And the other thing that you should know about John when we get to John is that a lot of times that he's making these statements, he's making them during a ceremony that is supposed to be respected, right? I mean, look, for example, when he says, uh, uh, I am the light of the world, right? I mean, that sounds nice, right? He's the light of the world. We have churches called the light of the world. You know, we light lights, you know, it's a beautiful metaphor. But he's doing this during the Festival of Tabernacles, and in the tabernacle festival, they're, ha they're having a lighting ceremony. I mean, think about that, having a church ceremony where they're doing something very pious, ceremonial, ritualistic. It's a special occasion. Everybody comes once a year. They're all dressed up. There's a lighting ceremony. And it's basically representing God being the light, the pillar of fire in the desert. They're commemorating something sacred in their history. And along comes Jesus. He gets up. There are things going on. And he says, I am the light of the world. And whoever comes to me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I mean, the, no wonder he got killed. You can't do that, right? You couldn't do that here. I mean, ushers would immediately come, like, okay, this usher not over here. You know, this is a problem, right? And we miss the fact how problematic Jesus was because the traditions have been just homogenized, they're decontextualized, they serve their own purpose. There's nothing wrong with that. That's life. But you realize that when you're reading this in the 21st century, it's not like reading it in the first century. And it's certainly not like being there. I mean, we have anesthetized, right, everything. Right? We've cleaned it up. I'll give you one more macabre example. You'll love it. Um, Calvary. How many churches do we know called Calvary? Probably all go to a Calvary church, right? I teach at a Calvary church. That's a, it's a wonderful thing, right? Calvary is a... My heart just is strangely warmed when I see that Calvary all across. Calvary, you guys know what that word means? That's right. Actually, it comes from the Latin word which means skull, skull, right? So all of these churches, you get some ancient Roman running around here and sees Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. To him, it's skull, 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 skull. It's like instead of a cross, you got skull and crossbones. It's macabre. It was the place of an execution, Right? I mean, so, so these things, again, are not, uh, you know, they're glorious now. The metaphors have been transformed. But originally, you know, this wasn't catching, uh, uh, you know, any honey, any bees with honey, right? Anyway, okay, let's go on. Just a, a sidebar. The demons are aware of Jesus' identity. Every time they show up, they're like, ah, we know who you are. You're the son of God. And he shuts them down immediately, right? Uh, some of the language that's used... Uh, is of Jesus uh, like bridling them, like, sh you know, muzzling them, like you do with, a, with, with, with a, a dog or a horse, right? He does that to them. Uh, we don't know why he shuts them down necessarily. They're saying the truth. 
Maybe he didn't need to hear it from them. Some scholars think that what's happening here is that in the ancient world, if you could name a deity or name a demon, you could exert control over it. And that was an attempt by these demon-possessed individuals, and Jesus basically supersedes that. But Mark never tells us that. All we know is that he tells them, shut up, right? Pipe down. Uh, So the demons are repeatedly aware of his identity. And interestingly, I I mentioned this yesterday, but it bears repeating again. In John's gospel, there's not one single solitary demon possession. Not a one. Demons never confront him. He never has to shut them down. He's above that. Interestingly, the word demon does show up. But you know when it shows up? When they're calling him demon-possessed. Now think about the irony of that. They say, aren't we correct in calling you a Samaritan and demon-possessed? Right? It's like a double whammy, right? So no demonic possessions, but they do have the temerity to say Jesus is demon-possessed. Right? So that's the kind of situation we're dealing with. You don't realize how polemical this is, to you, you put it that way. The disciples ironically failed to grasp the significance of Jesus' identity. Now, they knew he was something special. They're his followers. They're his fishing buddies. They've seen what he can do. But they didn't quite get the significance of it. And that shows up over and over again. And this is where Mark's gospel is really important because what you have essentially is a manual for discipleship. The disciples, we're supposed to read this story essentially and look at ourselves in there. Which one of us perhaps is like Peter or James or John, right? I mean, you know, these guys are are long gone, right? The stories, however, remain. So the disciples don't quite get it. There are a few examples. Of course, Peter. Peter's always getting in trouble. Uh, You know, Jesus in Caesarea Philippi asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And, you know, everybody's throwing out answers. And, oh, oh, oh. And Peter nails it. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. And, of course, he gets a high five from Jesus. Great answer. You got it, right? You know, son of, you know, the, the Spirit has revealed it to you. Now, interestingly, up to this point, Mark's gospel had been moving with signs and wonders and miraculous powers, right? And, and Peter's like, you're the son of God, right? At that point, the you know, Caesarea Philippi represents kind of a transition. Jesus starts to talk about his death. And immediately says, the son of man must be delivered up, beaten, persecuted, killed, rise on a third day. And you guys know the story, right? Peter gets up. He's like, no, wait, there's an outrage. May it never be, right? No way. I mean, certainly that's not what son of God means. That's not what Messiah means, right? And Jesus, I mean, imagine the fall from grace at that moment for Peter. From being, you know, ooh, 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 I know the answer. To being told, get thee behind me, Satan. For you've set your eyes not on God's things, but on man's, right? Now, if that were, and that's pretty bad. That's bad enough, right? But then Jesus launches off into this talk about the cross. And he said, let me tell you something else. (laughs) Not just me, but you, right? Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me has no part with me. He tells him straight out. This is what this business is about. It's about the cross. And not only do I have to bear it, but you have to bear it. And then he goes on and makes matters even worse. And he says, "Hmm, if you are ashamed of me in this wicked and adulterous generation, I will be ashamed of you. I won't confess you before my father and his angels. So this is not a matter of me. This is a matter of you, right? And, and, you know, we have this notion, again, the cross is this beautiful kind of thing. I have a hymn, oh, that old rugged cross, etc., right? That's all fine. But this is an instrument of torture and execution, Right? This is not, oh, Hernandez's class, man, that thing gives me a headache. I'm bearing a cross, right? It's not that, right? In Mark, it's you choose to die if you follow me, right? If you take up a cross, you take it with the expectation of being crucified on it. How do we contemporize that? Well, think about it this way. Take up your electric chair. I mean, think about, you know, that's a horrific instrument. I don't know if you ever see the old ones, you know, with the leather straps and the cap and all that. I mean, we've beautified the cross. But in that day and age, crosses were a public spectacle. They essentially were like lynchings meant to deter people from, you know, subverting the, the Roman government, etc. 
and they would put you on display. There were Pharisees who were, who were crucified. Sometimes they would line up hundreds of people who had been crucified. And by the way, oftentimes, they, maybe all the time, were naked. This was an, an object of humiliation, an instrument of torture. Roman citizens would not have been crucified. It was reserved for the worst of the worst. It was reserved for slaves. So Jesus did not even have the dignity of a Roman death. Be- beheading, actually, was a privileged way of going, if you can, you can imagine that, right? So why did they crucify you? Why did they throw you up there naked? Well, this is the other thing that we often don't think about. They were left there for the scavengers. The bodies were there, right? So you get birds come down. Crosses weren't all high up. They're low to the ground. You could have dogs ravaging at you, right? The bodies were, were, were meant to be consumed. It was a public display of abject humiliation for the worst of the worst, meant to deter. Peter would have known what crucifixion meant. James, John, all these guys would have understood the horror of that. That is not something that is glorious, it's horrific. And you're the son of God? And you're telling me you're dying like that? And not only you, but me? And if I don't, then I have no part in your kingdom? Right? I mean, that's, that is really striking, but that's exactly what's going on. Right? The equivalent today would be as if we had, if, rather than a cross, we're carrying a little emblem of an electric chair. Or of a syringe with a deadly cocktail, you know, execution cocktail, anything like that, gallows, it's macabre, right? It was macabre back then, right? Today, we've transformed it, something beautiful, right? When Jesus was talking about it, he was talking about actual death. He wasn't talking about an ornament. So, of course, Peter denied him. Of course, Peter said, no, 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 I never knew him. And he fulfills the words of Jesus, right? Before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. This is a serious business. So the disciples don't get it. And that's what Mark's gospel is trying to do like a lot of the other gospels. They're trying to get everybody on board and comfortable with and understanding what is this really about, this life of discipleship. It's not what you thought. And I'm going to lead the way. And that way involves death. It's not until Luke's gospel where the image is softened a little bit and he talks about take up your cross daily which is different right this is not the the guy who said this actually ends up on the cross at the end of the story right okay so you've got peter doesn't get it chapter 8 chapter 14 that's where he's denying him we've we've uh, talked about that james and john don't get it right james and john you know james and john right they're the ones who come to jesus and they're like "Oh, oh lord you know do us a solid, right? That's a little favor, right? Would you grant <laughs> that one of us sits on your right hand on your left? Right? Like they knew that Jesus was a Messiah. They knew there would be a banquet, a wedding banquet. They knew there was something, some shindig. We want a seat right up front next to you. We want to be next to you, left and right, right? And Jesus is like, well, are you ready to drink the cup that I'm going to drink of? And be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with. And of course, he's talking metaphorically about what? His death. And they're like, oh, sure, scout's honor. We're there. We can do it. Right? And he says, well, you will (laughs) drink of the cup and be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized with. But sitting at the right hand and left is Father's business. Right? They misunderstand. And ironically, and this is where you want to pay attention to what Mark is doing. They asked, can we sit at the right and the left? That's where we want to be. And he directed them towards death. That's what's, that's what's required. And by the way, even if you did, doesn't mean you're going to end up there. The only other time we have anyone at the right and the left of Jesus is at the end when he's on the cross. And the bandits are there sharing death. But they're hurling insults at him. James and John wanted honor. These guys hurled insults. Being close to Jesus, whether it's here or there, is death. That's amazing to me. I mean, I wish Mark had told me he was going to do that. I found out years later as I'm, you know, cobbling the material together. That's fantastic. So you have these subtle, interesting moves and juxtapositions that essentially highlight discipleship. It's about death, folks. 
Protestants are quick to run to glory, quick to run to the resurrection. There's a doorway there, and it's death. So James and John clearly don't get it. Judas almost goes without saying. He ultimately didn't get it, right? I mean, he says, you know, I am off of this Jesus train. I do not get it, right? If anything, he might have been the one with most integrity. He says, no, I don't buy it, right? And he does something about it. All deserted him at the end, right? So you got the summative statement that uh, no one was hanging around Jesus at the very end. There are some exceptions. I'll just list these here. Number one, the Galilean women who come to the cross or come to the tomb, right? Uh, They may be exceptions to this notion of not getting it. But, you know, they were stunned that he wasn't there. So maybe they didn't really get it either. They had courage to go there and anoint his body. Uh, So their story is a little different. And Joseph of Arimathea. Right? He's the one who asks for the body of Jesus and builds him a tomb. And by the way, uh, you know, that is essentially what spared Jesus the fate of being eaten up by scavenging animals, right? I mean, you think about that. Uh, well, let me put it this way. There have been hundreds, thousands of crucifixions in the ancient world. They're all over the historical record. You know how many... Uh, artifacts we have of crucifixions from that period? One. And it was found in the 1960s. And it was, it's a, it was a heel bone uh, with, with a fossilized, a fossilized heel bone with a nail in it, right? And it was found because apparently after this guy was crucified, it was placed in a, a bone box, an ossuary, right? So whatever happened to the body, his family had enough whatever, to, to get the body and put it in a box and, and bury it. Well, we found that one heel bone with a nail through it. That's all we have. We know crucifixions were constant. Why don't we have all of those bodies? Well, obviously, the ravages of time and history and all of that, but also if your body is being eaten up by stray dogs, vultures, what's left? And, and wood, well, wood just rots. And if there's any nails, those just, you know, they just go into the ground. Who knows where they came from, right? So this is a really interesting kind of thing, something so prominent in our Gospels for which nobody doubts there's evidence. In terms of artifacts, one heel bone with a nail through it. You can look it up online and you can actually see it. Okay, secrecy in Mark. This is one of the riddles in Mark, and I will let you know that, you know, uh, I'm okay with riddles. I'm okay with not knowing the answers to all the questions. And this is one of those that has been puzzling scholars for uh, cent- uh, well, I don't know about centuries, decades and decades and decades. Uh, secrecy in Mark. One of the things that Mark displays Jesus is doing is trying to hide his identity. Every time he does something, he shuts someone down, says don't tell anybody, right? He tries to hide his identity. It's really puzzling because the, the first thing... <laughs> Mark says, it's a good news. And we think about a preacher. Preacher, you spread the gospel, right? You do marketing. You get out there. But Jesus tries to veil who he is consistently. It's very different than in John's gospel where he's out there in public. Right? I'm this. I'm that. I'm the other thing. So just a few examples. His identity is not to be divulged by demons. We talked about that, but we'll put them in here as characters. Anytime a demon utters his name or utters his title, he shuts them down right? Don't need to hear that. No one needs to hear that. Those he healed. Now, this is really interesting because it's one thing if Jesus healed in secret, right? If, if he took someone and said, okay, let's go back to the prayer room, <laughs> and I'm going to pray for you, and you'll be healed, right? And then he says, don't tell anybody. Okay. How'd you get healed? I I really can't tell you. Okay. (laughs) But if he does it in public, what effect is that when there's a cloud of witnesses seeing the healing or knowing the healing took place? And even in those instances, he says, don't tell anybody. Right? It's kind of a riddle. Like, how does that work? Which also kind of leads you to think, okay, the gospel is doing more than I can understand here. And you just have to kind of keep working through it. Let me give you an example of of how uh, how silly this might sound. Think about Jairus' daughter. Remember Jairus' daughter? She was sick. Jesus went to heal her. He gets there. There's a throng of people mourning. 
And they say, well, don't worry about it. She's gone. We saw the flat line. Dee, she's dead, right? He says, no, 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 no. She's not dead. She's sleeping. What do they do? They start laughing. We know she's dead. What does he do? He goes into her house, takes his disciples, goes upstairs. There she is laying. And he says, Tabitakum, right, which is Aramaic for little girl, get up. And he grabs her by the hand, which is also very interesting because as a corpse, she would have been unclean and would have made Jesus unclean. Anybody in that room would have been considered unclean according to the book of Leviticus. Not only did nobody become unclean, she came to life, right? So she comes to life and he says, give her something to eat. And then he says, don't tell anybody. What's going to happen when she shows up at the store in the morning to buy bread? <laughs> Weren't you dead? <laughs> I can't tell you. Right? So, so, you know, you have to ask, you know, what is Mark's gospel doing? And this is something that has puzzled readers for a long time, right? And, and you just have to almost uh, uh, stretch your mind to read creatively and, and figure out some other answer for this. And also, it, it keeps you from being too, too dogmatic. There's only one answer, right? I don't think Mark believes that. His disciples, of course, they're told over and over again, don't tell anybody when he does something. The parables. This is probably the most puzzling uh, part. The parables. When you ask somebody, hey, what was Jesus' favorite method of teaching? Everybody knows it's parables. And they even use the example, man, Jesus was such a great teacher. He could break things down. And you have these stories. You don't got to be a, this is what they direct to me, right? You don't got to be a theologian and read all of these books to understand Jesus. He just told basic stories. Even a child could understand. And they all come to him. And you get this, like, this parable is this magic story that everybody understands it. That's not how they are presented in the Gospels. Don't you realize that every time Jesus told a parable, one of two things happened. A, we don't understand what you're talking about. Or B, we get it. You're going to die for that one, right? I mean, that's what you get. You never get someone feeling, oh, you know, that's, that's a great story. How uplifting, you know. Boy, Pastor Jesus really does know how to preach the word. No. They're outraged or they're moving him towards a cliff. Or they're like, what is he talking about, right? That's clearest in Mark, right? He tells parables. He's telling the parables. Sower goes to sow. Everybody here probably thinks, I know what that's about, Right? And, you know, the disciples get together with him at the end of that story. And, uh, and they're like, oh, Jesus, man, great story. Boy, you really know how to spin a yarn, blah, blah, blah. And they go, what does it mean? <laughs> like, you know, they're wrapped up. They like it, but they're like, what does it mean? And, of course, he yells at them, right, which probably doesn't make matters any better. He says, oh, you know, you're slow of understanding. By the way, Jesus is really hard on the disciples in Mark. It's softened up in, in Matthew. Uh, and then he tells them. To you has been given the secrets of the kingdom, but to everybody else, parables. Think about what he's saying about parables there. Only those to whom I choose to give understanding are going to get it. Everybody else gets a parable, which basically is like saying everybody else gets a riddle. If you don't understand it and I don't give you the understanding, you're an outsider. And then it gets worse. Depending where you are in a theological spectrum, you might rejoice at this. I don't know. <laughs> he says that they may not perceive or understand or turn again and be forgiven. Why do you speak in parables? So that they may not understand and they may not turn and they may not be forgiven. I mean, that's an outrage. If you read that straight up the way it sounds... Wait a minute, I thought the gospel was good news. I thought it was to share for everybody. You know, what is he talking about here? Not only is he not giving the interpretation to everybody, but those who are out are left in the lurch. They're lost. And that's why I'm doing it, right? So something really interesting and mysterious is going on here, right? And, and scholars have been puzzled over this, but this is also part of that messianic secret. What is, what is that about? Matthew handles this a little differently, right? You have Jesus saying, I speak in parables, in order that they may not, right? Matthew, on the other hand, says, I speak in parables because they do not see, understand. It's very different, purpose versus reason, right? And oftentimes you have the gospels wrestling with these issues and, and taking it in different directions, exploring the words and the meanings of what Jesus is doing, right? Now, 
what does it require? It requires some creativity. How do you think about this, right? This could be a sarcastic statement. That's the thing we miss with reading, right? There's no body language. There's no tone. It's just the words. And if you read dogmatically, straightforward, in a linear way, like, well, that's that. Some of you are going, some of you aren't, right? But think about this. What effect does it have on someone when you say, this isn't for you. This is for these people. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean it's not for me? Why isn't it for me? Right? If anything, it may prompt a craving to look for the truth, to find answers. Who knows? Right? It could be a way of rendering judgment. Right? Basically saying you will become like the idols you serve. They can't see. They can't hear. They can't understand. That's where you are. Right? Who knows? So really interesting, the use of parables, that if you actually read the script, irrespective of how you interpret this, and there are a number of ways of looking at this. I'm not dogmatic about it. But it certainly isn't, boy, Jesus is a great storyteller, right? And everybody loves his stories, and he just coddles us like children all the time. These are hard sayings, right? And, you know, so you've got this interesting thing going on here, and, and it's, it's stuff for us to think about, meditate on, you know, revere God even, right? And we use language that way as well, right? We say things that we don't mean, or we say the extreme, right, uh, to get people to think, right? Okay, structure, and this, this will, we'll go through quickly, I'm just going to put this up here, you don't have to jot this down. This is just the structure of Mark's gospel. We talked about this yesterday when we compare Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, not John, because John's very different. Uh, you've got the inaugural events in Judea, right, that's where you have the baptism. Uh, then the healing and teaching ministry in Galilee, right, so there's eight chapters of ministry in Galilee. Uh, this is north of, of Judea. Uh, signs and wonders, signs and wonders, signs and wonders, right? And then Peter's confession to Caesarea Philippi right in the middle, right? It's a hinge moment. And after that, Jesus starts to talk repeatedly about his death. The narrative slows down, goes to the Judea and the Transjordan. That's just the area uh, east of the Jordan River. And then you got the passion predictions fulfilled in Jerusalem, right? All three Gospels move in that direction, right? Even though they're spread out, they're structured a little differently with some brackets in there, but they all move in that direction, and Jesus is finally crucified in uh, Jerusalem. When we get to John's Gospel, John's Gospel, his itinerary is very different. Synoptics, or when I say synoptics, by the way, I'm referring to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Synoptic Gospels, Galilee, Judea, just one direction. John's Gospel, Galilee, Judea, Galilee, Judea, Galilee, Judea, Galilee, Judea, right? Interesting. Uh, the Gospels, Synoptic Gospels, one Passover, the last one. John's Gospel, multiple Passovers, right? And not only that, Jesus goes to the Feast of Tabernacles, the Festival of Dedication. He goes to various feasts, goes to none of them in the Synoptic Gospels. Another very interesting difference. Okay, the brevity of Mark, we talked a little bit about this. 60% the length of Matthew and Luke. I didn't give you any stats last time, but that's what you have, 60% the length of Matthew and Luke. No birth story. Talked about that, right? No birth story. He's a grown man. Uh, Joseph doesn't even show up in the narrative. Nowhere. Jesus is the one who's the carpenter. Uh, so there's no Bethlehem. By the way, Bethlehem is not even mentioned in Mark's gospel, right? Jesus is from Nazareth, and his home is Capernaum. No genealogy, right? Matthew and Luke provide us great genealogies. The closest thing you have is Jesus of Nazareth. That's it. By the way, John gives us the ultimate genealogy, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It says it all. No resurrection appearances. Again, it's implied. It's implied because the tomb is empty. The man at the tomb says, hey, he's gone ahead to Galilee. Tell the others, tell Peter, right? Um, Jesus actually mentions rising on a third day in several spots, but you don't have a description. You're kind of just left with an empty tomb and kind of think about what's, what's going on here. No ascension. The end of Luke's gospel, he ascends, right? The beginning of the book of Acts, it, com it, it begins with the ascension. No ascension at all. I mean, you don't even know what happened to Judas, right? It's just kind of everybody just melts into the background. There's less attention to the baptism, right? The baptism story is, is really short. John the Baptist is out there. He's baptizing for the remissions of sins. Jesus shows up, and he gets baptized, right? No big deal. Matthew's gospel, there's a little back and forth between John the Baptist and Jesus. Jesus shows up, 
goes to get baptized. Jesus is like, what, you know, John's the Baptist is like, what are you doing here? Uh, you, you shouldn't be baptized by me. I should be baptized by you. And she's like, wow, shucks. Let's just do this, right? And they do it, right? There's a back and forth, right? Uh, it's a little longer. The temptation, the temptation uh, when Jesus is tempted uh, by the devil in, in, in Mark's gospel, it's short. The devil tempted him. It was there for 40 days and 40 nights. That's it. Matthew and Luke, on the other hand, they give you the actual script. The devil said this. Jesus responded that. The devil said this. And they're, they're basically having a back and forth scripture battle, right? Interestingly, they both say the same things except in different directions. Not unlike the genealogies that were also in different directions, right? So really interesting. And if you, if you read that temptation story, you can see that it's really not meant to disclose to us, hey, this is what Jesus said. This is what the devil said. It's like this is how you deal with temptation. This is how you deal with problems. And, and interestingly, the temptation comes in the form of Scripture. Think about that. You know, a temptation that comes out of left field that is blatantly and obviously wrong is still a temptation. And people fall all the time, right? The more dangerous ones are the ones that have the backing of Scripture. Satan did not show up without Scripture. He showed up with Scripture, right? And I think that that's a valuable lesson for all of us to learn. Many things seem scriptural that are actually downright idolatrous. They may say Christianity. They may say Christian values. They may say this is the way to serve. But maybe they're picking one passage and not the whole counsel of God, right? The devil wasn't using, you know, blatant temptation it was it was the bible the bible think about that 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 should be a wake-up call for all of us right here right now especially in this day and age how many people use the bible right as cover for things that are downright non-scriptural right they got to think about that okay there's a lengthier account of john the baptist's death john the baptist of course dies here he's beheaded it's a lengthy account matthew shortens it quite a bit right and it's even shorter in Luke's gospel. I don't think it's even mentioned in John's. Um, and this is, this is very interesting because when you think about the gospel writers as writers, you know, there are some stories that you can expand. And there are some stories you will, you will render a little shorter. If you ever have a writing class and they're like, write an essay. Tell you know, what you did last summer. And you, know, you write an essay and the teacher returns it to you and says, okay, this is great. But, but you devoted too much time to this time at the lake. It really drags the whole thing down. You really only need a couple of sentences, right? And get the same point across. Well, you see that tendency as well in the gospel writers in terms of what they include and also what they kind of prune. And this is one of those. Abrupt beginning and end. Abrupt beginning and end, right? It starts out, Jesus is a grown man. He's running, right? And, and first he goes into the synagogue. He encounters the possessed person. And at the end, there's an empty tomb. That's it. The, by the way, the, the book also uses the word immediately, 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 over and over again. It is abrupt in its beginning, like a gunfire, right? Run, and then end. Which is why it seems so incomplete. Which is why it wasn't copied as much. Which is why Matthew was the favored gospel. There is less of Jesus' teaching, and this is comparatively speaking, right? So, uh, you've got fewer parables than Matthew or Luke. There's no Sermon on the Mount. Everybody knows the Sermon on the Mount, right? Or in Luke's Gospel, the Sermon on the Plain, right? One's in a mount, one's in a plain. They're really interesting. Um, none of that. Now, it's not that some of those teachings don't show up here and there, but in terms of those locations and that lengthy material, I mean, that's three chapters in Matthew's Gospel, right? And none of that in Mark. There are, however, some interesting teaching sections. I just go through a few here. Uh, number one, the parable section, which we just talked about. We talks about the parable of the sower. You got several parables there. Uh, in chapter 9 and 10, you've got some teachings directed at the disciples. And usually, this isn't Jesus, you know, sitting down, I'm going to teach you something. Usually, it's a response, right? They will say something like, you know, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, right? And then he'll take some time to teach them, right? So those responses and those engagement between Jesus and the disciples are also teaching sections, right? Another one, apocalyptic discourse. This is chapter 13 where he talks about uh, the end of the world, as it were, right? The, the destruction of the temple, wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, all of that stuff, right? This is all in chapter 13. It's known as the apocalyptic discourse. It is teaching. 
There's also substantial teaching in the controversy stories, right? Jesus is always getting himself into trouble. There are controversies that swirl around him. Those controversies aren't just a record. Hey, here's another, another episode of Jesus really riling up the crowd, right? It's usually designed to teach you something, right? So the story you guys all know, uh, the paralytic, right? Guy's paralytic, and they, what do they do? They climb the roof. And they start to dig through the roof to bring him in because the house is crowded and it's got hay and mud at the top. And they bring him down. Everybody's watching to see what would Jesus do, right? And Jesus, the first thing he says to the paralytic is what? Your sins are forgiven. I spared you the quiz this time. Don't make me do it again. <laughs> right? you, you, yeah. Your sins are forgiven. Which is an outrageous thing to say, right? And the people there, especially the scribes, are like, well, who is this guy? Who can forgive sins but God? Hey, come on. Give us a break. And he said, well, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he says to the paralytic, get up and walk. It's really interesting. The focus there is not on the healing. We all want Jesus to heal us. Heal me, heal me, heal me, Lord, right? The point wasn't the healing. The point was this is evidence that I have the authority to forgive sins, which is far greater, right? I mean, that's a powerful thing, right? And you can't really deny it, but I mean, anybody could say, your sins are forgiven. You know, I could say that. Your sins are forgiven. I can see it. There's no empirical proof of that, right? There certainly is of someone getting up and walking. And then the one who did it says, I did that because I first forgave his sins. This is really interesting, right? So, uh, a couple of things. Son of man shows up repeatedly in Mark's gospel. Son of man is actually Jesus' own self-designation. He never calls himself son of God. He always says son of man, son of man. It's like a circumlocution, a roundabout way of referring to himself. In the book of Daniel, the son of man is a, a, a human-like figure with divine authority, right? And he gets all power in heaven and on earth. So what's interesting is that when Jesus says the son of man, he's referring to himself as that figure, and then he's kind of telling you, what is the authority this Son of Man has? Well, in this case, it's the authority to forgive sins, right? And he'll do this repeatedly when he breaks the Sabbath, or his disciples break the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, right? Uh, well, on and on. So you, you get this idea that, that he's saying something about his identity as Son of Man. Son of Man is qualifying Son of God. We usually think of Son of God as referring to divine and Son of Man to the humanity. It's actually the reverse. Son of God refers to his status as a king, as an anointed one, as Christ. Son of Man is a divine-like figure. Right. Very interesting. By the way, that story where uh, they go to the roof and they're removing the hay and, and the, the thatch, right? It's like muddy. A typical Palestinian house. Luke's gospel tells the same story, and Luke is a more cosmopolitan gospel. You know what they're taking off at the top? tiles they're taking tiles off right? which is contextualizing the message you go to matthew there's not even a house it just says he heals the paralytic right they're really interesting by the way another thing that matthew does again these just they're unbelievable in in mark's gospel it is james and john who come to jesus hey do us a solid you know sit on the right and the left right in matthew's gospel do you guys know who it is the mom the mom comes kneeling and beseeching, you know, grant that my two honor roll students sit at the right and the left, right? It's a much more softened look. Very interesting. Okay, language and literary artistry. What do I got? I got seven minutes to do the impossible. Okay. Don't worry, we'll get through it. The Lord will supply. The Lord will slow down the clock. I think he could do that. <laughs> if he could multiply loaves, he could slow down the clock. Okay. So there's a, a rough-edged quality to the Greek in Mark. If you were taking a Greek class and you're studying the Gospels in the original Greek, Mark's Greek is rough. Now, you wouldn't know that as an Anglo from the 21st century, but if you had been studying it and studied all kinds of Greek writings, you would see that it's rough around the edges. We also know it's rough around the edges because when Matthew and Luke retell the same story, they tend to smooth out the languages. They tend to introduce conjunctions where there were no conjunctions. They tend to switch the tense of verbs, right? They tend to, to move things around to smooth. And it's kind of like an editor, right? You write up a little note, and you're like, well, this looks pretty good. It's pretty clear. You hand it to your editor. They bleed all over it, reword it. So, you know, there's no transition here. You went too long there. Wrap this up. Da, 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 and they give it back to you. 
like, oh man, I can tighten things up, right? Matthew and Luke and retelling the same stories often are smoothing things out in a way that would be an improvement of the Greek. The worst Greek, by the way, in the, in the, in, uh, the New Testament is the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, if you were a stickler for grammar, if you loved perfection, and you're reading through that and you love eloquence, it would be like nails on a board. <laughs> and he just he throws things out there. You're like, really, John, what's going on here? Right? And sc- scholars have also puzzled whether this was deliberate or not because there are times where he uses the grammar right, times when he doesn't, right? Correctly, I should say. So uh, anyway, the best Greek is in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews Greek is so eloquent, so sophisticated, that as you're reading it, sometimes you can't tell what it's connecting to it's prior or, or 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 subsequent usually language that's poetic you know and very elusive it's h- harder to nail down kind of the structure uh, hebrews is, is like that it's like one really poetic homily okay uh mark uses catchwords to link stories this is interesting we're not going to talk about this particular segment we'll, we'll find links elsewhere but this is fantastic where he'll tell a story and there will be words that will crop up in a story and he'll move on to another story and similar words will show up. So again, he's not just telling you, hey, here's everything that ever happened. One, two, three, four, five, six, chronologically, historically, linearly. No. He's juxtaposing stories in a certain way, and he's drawing your attention to them with li- linking words. Hybrid stories. Smaller stories into larger ones. This is one of my favorite. I'm going to give you at least, I, ho- I hope to give you at least one example. Oh, my God. What do I got? Four minutes? Start praying, church. <laughs> well, I'll end on this example. We will get through all the material, but, you know, sometimes the spirit leads. Okay, so hybrid stories. These are stories where you have uh, what we call an A-B-A pattern, an A-B-A pattern. And what happens is that Mark will start a story, right, the A story, not finish it, move on to the B story, finish it, and then come back to the A story, right? He does this repeatedly. It's not unlike a movie where they'll have a a plot and a subplot. And usually they're supposed to shed light on each other or contrast each other. The first one and the last one, the only one I'm going to give you today, we'll pick this up tomorrow, is Jesus versus the scribes and Jesus versus the family. Jesus versus the scribes and Jesus versus the family. So, See, 319, I'm just going to write this here, 319B to 21, 322, let's see, to 30, and then 331, I believe it's to 35. Okay, yes, okay, so this is, the, this is, this is, this is what you have in Mark chapter 3. Now, again, there, you can read these stories, and you can read them a certain way, read them very Flatly, literally, this is kind of what's happening. But look at the subtlety of what's going on here. So, in chapter 3, verse 19 through 21, you have his family who's coming to get Jesus. And Jesus is in a house where he's debating with the scribes. And his family is what? They are outside. They are physically outside of the house. And they have come to retrieve Jesus. Do you know why they've come to retrieve Jesus? In the Greek, it says this, because they thought he was outside of himself. You know what that means, right? Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. Now, it doesn't mean they actually thought he was. They might say, this guy's going to get himself killed. Look at what he's saying. He's in that house with a bunch of scribes. This guy's crazy, right? But note the wordplay. They are physically outside. And they're saying, it's outside of himself. Let's, let's save him from himself, right? Think about this as a camera then pans to the inside. And Jesus is there, and he's tussling it out with, with the scribes, right? And what are they talking about? You guys remember? Peter. Call St. Pete for a quiz. What are they doing? They're talking about demon possession. Casting out demons right they're there and they're like hey you're able to cast out demons through the power of darkness through Beelzebub right 
And Jesus says, you know, Satan cannot cast out Satan. So they are actually literally talking about casting out that same kind of word play. And then he says something revealing. Why is it that Satan cannot cast out Satan? Divided house cannot stand. Divided house. Which is really interesting because what is he in? A house. And who's outside the house? His family. And who's inside the house? Jesus. I mean, you know, other people, Jesus is the primary, right? So, you got this opening, A. And then you got B. And then it goes back to A. And Mark says again, his family was still outside. And he mentions the word outside two or three times or outside. And they say, go call Jesus. Right? They tell Jesus, your family is outside calling from you. And what does Jesus say? Who is my family? Who is my... I mean, moms will love this. <laughs> Who's my mother? Who are my brothers? Who are my sisters? Those who do the will of God and keep it. And Think about that. What is this ABA pattern about? It's defining who is an insider and who is an outsider. Right? It's not about blood relations. It isn't about my physical sister, brother, mother, father. It redefines family. So while on the surface this is a story about his family thinks he's nuts and he's going to get himself in trouble. And the scribes also think he's nuts. By the way, when they talked about demon possession, it was, it was like a synonymous with being nuts, right? And he says, no, 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 no. Those that think you're nuts are outsiders, those that are with me and do God's will, those are the insiders. So you, Mark here uses an A, B, A pattern to redefine family, right? Now our brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers, our brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers in the Lord, okay? We'll pick up on this tomorrow. We'll go through four more of these in Mark's gospel. Thank you very much.